first sign that the world order you know is broken in a way is that hierarchies do not translate into predictable outcomes i mean the common factors that you see that tell you that there is not in fact a governing order a hierarchical system that works you can analytically say yes there is a power hierarchy america has the most nuclear weapons and then this 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 yeah. this but does that translate into reality? So the first evidence is the lack of translation into reality of the hierarchy that exists on paper. Number two is that there is not a functional, institutional, legal architecture uh, that really works in the same way that the hierarchy of empires is not really working either. So, you know, for someone my age, when I was in the 1990s in university, people still talked about the role of the United Nations in X, the role of the United Nations in Y, and the role of the United Nations in Z. Uh, and the reform of the UN Security Council was a very big issue, right? Today, no one talks about the reform of the Security Council and no one cares whether or not it will happen. No one talks about the role of the United Nations in X, in Y, or in Z. In fact, almost no one talks about it at all. That's evolution. And we've evolved, or where we are at this point in global evolution is that there is not this one single hierarchical, legal, political, diplomatic structure or system. Yeah. So we're in between that phase and something else. So world order has broken down, you know, for a wide range of, of reasons. Also, of course, we have all these new kinds of forces, whether it's NGOs or media or companies or terrorists or diasporas. Uh, they are not properly integrated into that new system. They are building it ad hoc, ad hoc. We are an ad hoc sort of sort of world. A lot of the other interviews have said that the power, there's a change of power and power is going away from, from governments, multinationals, UN, to us. So there is a change of power from those big hierarchical institutions mm -hmm. to more the horizontal people right. thing. People I believe in this. I think what you're referring to, though, is not so much power, but authority, right? So authority is who has credibility, who has recognition, um, you know, who are your trusted sources, um, you know, who do you turn to for services or for information? That's easier to explain than this notion of power that's a bit uh, sort of, you know, ethereal. So I think in the case of what you're arguing, the, it's about switching from the role, what some people say is the age of deference, deference to authority, deference to governments, towards the age of reference, right? In who are you referring to? You know, how many people posted an article on a Facebook page, you know, and uh, did your friends tell you about it or did you see it on the news? And you might believe in something more that friends have sent to you than something you see on the news. Yeah. And that is the shift from the age of deference to the age of reference. And I think it's very clear that that is happening. But the best way to capture it or to explain it to, to audiences is, of course, to use examples, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, to talk about how the Arab Spring was a phenomenon where people communicated horizontally and said it's time to, you know, get out and, and protest and demonstrate and make a, a cause out of this. So to spark a movement and using social media for that. That was a very crucial factor, right? Yeah. So what do you think is causing this change of power? Why why is it there, this trend? Well again, power and authority and recognition and credibility and reputation, these are all different things, right? But all of them are also connected in some way. So, you know, when we talk about power, we have to be very careful when we say, you know, power in the sense of leverage, I prefer the word leverage, right? Which is, you know, your ability to uh, bring about an action, you know, through your influence. Leverage can be really based on your your connectivity, right? You know, your the size of your network, you know, who you can influence your capital, how much money you have. And of course, a non-governmental actor like a company or, or a philanthropist can have a lot of money. Um, and it can be, of course, uh, you know, your, your technological capacity, ability to reach and mobilize and organize. So there are lots of uh, inputs to that leverage. And so when you say, what is the cause? I think if you had to break it down, I would simply say capitalism and technology right, uh, two particular drivers of this systemic 
change. So capitalism, of course, the expansion of global markets, the uh, ability to participate in those markets, not just as individual countries, but those countries have negotiated to allow companies to participate freely. And those companies have amassed their assets and resources and are able to move them around. Technology, the fact that almost everyone in the world has a mobile phone, mm -hmm. the fact that communication systems now link almost everyone. So you can create communities of identity that are not territorial or ethnic, but we can be linked by a cause, right? Environmental cause or a social cause or a political cause that is transnational. So, you know, I think the ultimate source of this change is capitalism and technology. <laughs> Have we become more powerful? Yes, in the aggregate, everyone has become more powerful. Because if you measure that power by your connectedness, your access to capital, your access to technology, your liberation from the prison of national identity only, your mobility or ability to move across borders, by any of those measures, we now have more freedom, more access to resources, and therefore more potential power as individuals than ever in history. Yeah. That is absolutely true. And at the same time, we're of course living in a period of chaos. And it's hard for a lot of young people to find jobs. Right. So how should they frame that? Like, like they are very, they have authority, they have leverage, they have power. Mm -hmm. But then they're sitting at home. <laughs> right. <laughs> then what? Right. Well, I mean, so the global chaos and people having a hard time finding jobs are are quite different. There is a linkage between them, but, but there are different sorts of, of issues. Again, the global chaos is the collapse of order that we were talking about earlier, uh, where you have a demise of authority and the ineffectiveness of the powers that exist today. And the simple fact that when you take the big step back, the very clear, neat structure is gone. And therefore, anything that is less orderly than that looks chaotic. Yeah. So yes, fine, it's chaotic. But again, to me, it's an opportunity, right? It's a liberation in many ways. But it does mean that everyone is on their own. You as an individual have to be your own strategist. Right? You do have to figure out what you're going to do. One has to create new jobs doing different things that, uh, you know, with the skill set that they have, even if it, they, there did not exist a job for that. And that, that's what innovation is all about. So is it the lasting chaos that we're in? Or will it change? Is it a period we have to go through? Or can I say to my friends, like, <laughs> it will be fine? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you cannot say that every, that there is a, that there is a st stable future model ahead if we just wait till the year 2040. Just like you cannot say that if we don't, don't act on climate change by 2025, then it's too late. In a complex system, you can never make such certain uh, prescriptions. Yeah, you're right. But do you, do you think we we like is the chaos the new normal security? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, chaos is the new normal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Hi. That would be a good title for this interview. Chaos is the new normal. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Does this chaos also brings effectiveness? Uh, it breeds innovation. Yeah. But because normally you would think, oh, this is so, it's such a chaos. We can't do anything. We can't right. get anything done. Or it's just, let's have order again. You can survive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, it's like, you know, what is order? An order that works for a world of 5 billion people may not be the same order that's necessary for a world of 9 billion people. Yeah. What it boils down to, to me, is whether or not you have faith in what looks like chaos. It looks like chaos. What looks like chaos to those who are opposed to this trend and who are afraid of it, to me, looks like new kinds of self-organization. So negative people who are skeptical look at it and they say, this is chaos. We don't want a world like this. I view it as liberation and new kinds of self-organization. How do you envision the role of young people in the transition we're in? Wow, I really make you think. Yes, you do. Young people have you know, disproportionate role in this new world because they're more young people as a percentage of the world's population than, than ever before. So this is a very young world. So in a way, young people are the subject and the object 
of this world that we're that there's being built right now so that that's quite special uh, so that's why their role is so important secondly again they are they've grown up in a world in which the old rules and hierarchies are no longer uh, valid per se so they have a willingness perhaps to take risks and to innovate than previous generations so i think that's why their role is exceptionally important so then what would be your message for young people and then especially for the people who are struggling in this chaotic world right um so my message for young people is you know, you have to immediately be building and start building your future whatever it is for you and by working in that way you will realize that you're building it for others too right no person is an island anymore so the community the collective of people who you work with you know is is absolutely integral to building that positive change and in a way that's also my message to young people who are struggling today which is that you're not alone actually everyone else is like you and you have to form new kinds of units that are effective agents whether you're providing welfare whether you're starting a company whether you're teaching yourselves new skills do those things in groups and you have a better chance of making a better future for yourself than if you were actually alone 